welcome Dr. Mohammed Munir to the program. He is a virologist at Lancaster University in the United Kingdom. Uh, doctor, thank you so much for being with us. These two vaccines, uh, which were developed separately, they both appear to have very high levels of effectiveness. What does that signal to you? I think these are really encouraging and I really uh, boosted our optimism on the vaccine. And uh, first, for example, when we had the Pfizer vaccine, um, those were interim data and we were not really, you know, at that scale, scale of optimism. But once having the Moderna uh, almost at the same level of efficacy, I think this is really a rubber stamp that we will have a vaccine and we will have a vaccine very soon. That means this is really a big milestone and really a watershed moment. Can you tell us uh, how do the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna one differ in terms of application and storage? Yeah, so both Moderna and Pfizer uh, vaccines, both they are based on the same technology called mRNA-based vaccines. What it does, it takes the genetic material of the virus, inject it into the cell, and uh, in the cell it produces the protein that is onto the surface of the virus. Our body immune system sends it and start producing the antibodies um, and also the T cell response and go together really protect the vaccinated people. So basically the technology is the same. However, there are some differences that make one better than other. For example, Moderna vaccine can be stored at the freezer uh, that is minus 20 Celsius, which is very common on the pharmacy, surgery and the small hospitals. Whereas the, uh, the Pfizer vaccine that required minus 80 Celsius storage it definitely required a separate infrastructure such as liquid nitrogen or dry ice carrier to, to really transport and ship. And I think one of the major advantage with the Moderna vaccine that is uh, based on the results announced today is that it not only protects just against the milder form of the infection, but it, it also protects against severe form of the infection. So that is really a plus again, uh, other than the storage uh, over Pfizer vaccine. Okay, that is, that's great news because with the Pfizer vaccine, a lot of the negative that we heard was that it needs to be kept in this super, super cold uh, freezer to be effective. Um, doctor, can you shed any light for our viewers on how multiple vaccines uh, coming out at the same time could help push up the timeline of how long it takes to get control of this virus? Uh, absolutely. I think this is the most critical uh, question to understand at this moment is that not one vaccine would be enough to really uh, immunize the people at the level that we needed to do. First, because there are challenges in the production and then there are challenges in the distribution and each technology we are having in different vaccine front runners, they are based on different principles. So this means that we have to have two or three vaccines that have a capability to produce billions of doses before we can really start seeing the impact of this vaccine. So Pfizer and Moderna, they are based on the same technology, but AstraZeneca, Janssen Johnson, and Sputnik V, they are based on the different technology and all of them, they are on the same technology themselves, which means that if we have mRNA-based vaccine and adenovirus-based vaccine, that means that we will have capability enough to, to produce the vaccine that would be at the scale to really see the benefit in curtailing this pandemic. We're seeing countries such as the United States and the United Kingdom uh, enter contracts with these companies for hundreds of millions of doses of these vaccines. Uh, for countries that maybe don't have the economic power of some of uh, in the Western world, I mean, are we looking at a situation where maybe it becomes where the coronavirus still exists in certain poorer parts of the world while it's already gone in other parts? I think this is, again, a very excellent question because I think once the vaccine would be uh, registered through the regulatory body, the next question and the challenge would be how the equitable distribution could be made. Um, as you said, that more of the wealthy nations, they already have pledged the vaccines and really sort of meeting the uh, capability of these pharmaceuticals to produce that vaccine. So the, the, the pharmaceuticals don't have any more capability to accommodate requests from other uh, poor countries, for example, based on the cost or uh, the pledging at the time. But one thing that WHO uh, does, which I also be part of, is that to have a facility that can uh, secure the, the doses of the vaccines for at least vulnerable communities in the low and middle income countries. So I think the emphasis should be from now onward is that not that, that the vaccine should be given to the one who have the wealth, but be given to the one who need it, because until not everybody is safe, nobody is safe.
Dr. Mohammed Munir from Lancaster University. Thank you. Really appreciate you helping us.